Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver, Pete Musto, and Dorothy Gundy. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Katie Weaver. Erade Kashgari carefully passes out small pieces of colorful clay to her five young students. Their assignment, Kashgari explains, is to form the clay into the shapes of letters. The students roll the clay in their small hands, bending it to make the letter A. They compare their results with each other and laugh with excitement. Kashgari's three- and four-year-old students are all Uyghur Americans. They are not learning the letters of English. They are learning Uyghur, a Turkic language spoken by more than 11 million ethnic Uyghurs in western China. Every Sunday, about 60 young Uyghurs come to Anacare Education in Northern Virginia to study their mother tongue. Ana means mother in the Uyghur language. Kashgari, who is 24, opened Anacare in 2017 with her mother, Surya. The small school offers language, culture, and Islamic religion classes. We decided to open an Uyghur school here in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax, Virginia, because it does have one of the largest populations um, of the diaspora in this area. And um, it really is a need. Kashgari herself was born in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and moved with her parents to the United States when she was a child. Xinjiang is a huge resource-rich area in the country's west. It shares a border with eight countries, including Pakistan, Russia, and Afghanistan. About 11 million Uyghurs live in Xinjiang, which means new frontier in Mandarin Chinese. Like many Uyghurs who live overseas, Kashgari calls the area East Turkestan. They consider their homeland to be occupied by China. The Uyghur language and culture are closely related to Turkish, Uzbek, Kazakh, and other Turkic groups. Today, Uyghurs use an Arabic-based writing system. In the two years since Anna Care opened, China has effectively turned Xinjiang into a police state, with block-by-block -block security checkpoints, spy cameras, and detention centers that China has called re-education camps. China says it is trying to prevent Islamic extremism and separatism among Uyghurs, who are mostly Muslim. It describes the camps as vocational training centers. But rights groups and experts have used phrases like Chinese gulags and concentration camps to describe the Xinjiang camps. Some Uyghur Americans call them brainwashing centers. Experts say more than one million people are detained in camps across Xinjiang. Among them are well-known Uyghur cultural leaders, professors, musicians, and writers. Former detainees have said they were forced to renounce their way of life religion, and their native language inside the camps. Some have even said 
that using or studying the Uyghur language was the reason for their detention. Darren Byler is a social scientist and Uyghur specialist at the University of Washington. In a recent piece for the website subchina.com, he wrote that any state employee who speaks Uyghur in public is now considered to be two-faced. This is a charge that has resulted in the detention of hundreds, if not thousands, of Uyghur public figures, Byler wrote. Xinjiang's regional policy states that both Mandarin Chinese and Uyghur are considered official languages. But in cities across the area, the Uyghur language is disappearing. Recorded images show Uyghur words being removed from business and street signs. Observers say bookstores that once offered large collections of Uyghur literature now have zero Uyghur books on their shelves. There have even been reports of large-scale burning of Uyghur books. Recent education restrictions mean that Uyghur children are no longer permitted to study in their mother tongue. Uyghur language teachers in Xinjiang have no one to teach. One Uyghur woman living in the United States told VOA that her sister taught Uyghur literature classes in Xinjiang's public schools for many years. Today, her sister is required to teach the national language, Mandarin Chinese, to detainees inside a camp. Back in Northern Virginia, 17-year-old Nadina pays close attention as her teacher goes through another set of letters in Uyghur. Nadina attends Anna Care's weekly class for older students who can speak the language but cannot read it. I'm trying to learn the Uyghur alphabet and um, like a lot of other things, speech, pronunciation. Nadina believes that she and other overseas Uyghurs have a special responsibility to learn their language as best as they can. Because the Chinese government currently is trying to get rid of our almost existence as a culture and trying to change everyone to make them speak Chinese and not speak our mother tongue anymore. So I think it's very important now that we learn the language and continue on so it never gets erased. Krishat Bilgin is another Anna Care student. He is 10 years old and in fifth grade. He has been studying Uyghur language and culture for two years. He says he feels lucky to be able to study his language. I come here to learn Uyghur because back in East Turkestan, um, people are not allowed to learn Uyghur, so I'm lucky I am in the U.S. so I can learn Uyghur. Nadina and Krishat's teachers at Anna Care did not wish to appear on camera or use their names. Even more than 10,000 kilometers away from China, they do not feel fully safe. Most still have parents or other family back home. They believe that media reports showing them teaching Uyghur in America would put their families in danger. Kashgari says she is extremely grateful for the teacher's language expertise. And she is happy that Anna Care has given them another chance to do what they love. Our teachers, uh, a lot of them got, uh, you know, great education in Uyghur uh, back in East Turkestan. And um, because of the current climate there, they had to leave. Um, and when they immigrated here, they didn't necessarily have a platform to continue teaching Uyghur. So uh, this has given them an opportunity to continue with their profession. One Uyghur American mother who wished to not use her name said she brings her two young children to Anna Care each Sunday. 
She told VOA that what Ana Care Education offers its community should not be considered unusual. She said, The very simple thing about learning our own native language, like many communities in the United States, it's a very normal thing to do. But for us, it's a crime. It's a crime to learn your own language. It's a very political thing. And that's sad. Being a Uyghur is a crime now. A traditional dress worn by Palestinian women was not the kind of clothing one would expect to become a sign of political expression. The brightly colored, embroidered woman's dress is known as a thobe, notes the Associated Press. Now the thobe is gaining popularity as a softer means of identifying with the fight for the establishment of a Palestinian state. It is even competing with the kafia, the head covering worn by Palestinian men protesting Israel's occupation of land they call their home. The thobe is covered with complex, colorful embroidery, all put together by hand. It requires months of hard work to make. Some thobes have been sold to buyers for thousands of dollars. The use of traditional cloth is a celebration of simpler times, when poor Palestinian women would make thobes while resting from a hard day's work in the fields. Rashida Talib is the first female Palestinian American member of the United States Congress. Last month, she wore her mother's thobe at her official swearing-in ceremony. The move has led women around the world, especially in Palestinian territories, to publish pictures of themselves in traditional dress on the Twitter social networking service. Rachel Dedman organized a recent exhibit at the Palestinian Museum in the town of Birzeit in the West Bank. The show centered on the changes to Palestinian embroidery throughout history. Dedman told the Associated Press, the thobe is such a powerful sign of political expression because it is more directly linked to culture and history, not politics. The historic thobe conjures an ideal of pure and untouched Palestine before the occupation, she said. The Palestinian Thobe's history dates back to the early 19th century, when embroidered goods were made mainly in villages. Beautifully designed dresses marked major events in women's lives, the beginning of puberty, marriage, motherhood. Maha Saka is the director of the Palestinian Heritage Center in Bethlehem. She says the designs were different from one village to the next. In Bethlehem, for example, wealthier women sought special three-dimensional embroidery. Bedouin women, who would spend their lives in traveling communities, made their thobes with large pockets for carrying things. Women from Jaffa, a city famous for its fruit trees, wore orange tree designs. Thobe designs also expressed women's different social positions. Red was the color for women about to be married, 
while blue was for women whose husbands had died. Blue, with multicolored embroidery, was for women who were thinking about getting remarried after their husband's death. During the first major Palestinian attempt to break free from Israel in the 1980s, guns and flowers were often part of Thobe designs. Now, Palestinian women of all social classes wear Thobes to show support for an independent nation at special events. It's a way of defending our national identity, Saka said. The care, hard work, and skill that go into making a thobe prevent it from becoming everyday clothing. But less costly, mass-produced versions of the dress have become popular. Younger Palestinians, especially those spread far from their homeland, are changing the traditional dresses to modern tastes. Girls are asking for shorter and less embroidered versions, notes Raja Gazaune, a thobe designer in the West Bank. Rashida Talib said her Palestinian thobe brought back memories of her mother's West Bank village. The U.S. Congresswoman called her choice to wear the dress a demonstration of her love for the Palestinian people. It has since increased interest in the dress worldwide. I'm Dorothy Gundy. And I'm Pete Musto. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. America's Civil War in the 1860s did not have the full support of the people. Many said they did not care who won, North or South. They just wanted to be left alone. In the North, Many young men refused to be drafted into the Union Army. Some of their protests turned violent. Southern leaders were pleased with the anti-war movement in the North. Confederate General Robert E. Lee saw it as a sign of weakness in the Northern War effort. He also saw it as an opening for a military victory. Lee hoped for a final, decisive blow that would bring the war to an end. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe talk about General Lee's campaign north to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Gettysburg was a small town. Many roads came together there. Robert E. Lee needed those roads to pull his army together quickly. He had 70,000 men in all, but they were spread over a wide area of southern Pennsylvania. Some were at York to the east. Some were at Carlisle to the north, and most were at Chambersburg to the west. All of them were ordered to move against the Union force at Gettysburg. General Robert E. Lee had not planned to go to Gettysburg. He had planned to capture Harrisburg, the state capital, and then Philadelphia. If successful, he would turn south to seize Baltimore and Washington. Lee had not worried about the large Union Army of the Potomac. He believed it was far behind him in Virginia. But Lee was wrong. The Union Army had followed him, and it had reached Gettysburg first.
The first group of northern soldiers formed a thin line of defense outside Gettysburg. The first group of southern soldiers attacked this line. It was the morning of July 1st, 1863. When the guns began to roar, both sides hurried more men to the front. After hours of fighting, the Confederates had pushed the Union soldiers back through the town. The Union soldiers formed a new line along a place called Cemetery Hill. General Robert E. Lee decided not to attack the hill immediately. He would wait for more men. But as he waited, more and more Union soldiers arrived. By sunrise the next day, Lee's 70,000 men faced a Union army of 90,000 men. The Confederates attacked both sides of the Union line. They moved the Union soldiers a little. But then the Union soldiers came back again. The Confederates could not hold the line. The fighting stopped at sunset. Union Commander George Meade met with his generals. He said he was sure General Lee would attack again the next day. The next attack, Meade said, would be against the center of the Union line. Meade was right. Lee planned to send 15,000 men against the Union center. They would be under the command of General George Pickett. When the sun rose on July 3rd, the Union troops were ready. They watched as the Confederate troops set up their cannon. More than 130 of these big guns were aimed at the center of the Union line. The morning passed. The day grew hotter. A little past one o'clock in the afternoon, a Confederate gun fired once. Then again. That was the signal to attack. All at once, the Confederate artillery thundered with a deafening roar. The cannon sent iron and smoke into the Union soldiers on Cemetery Hill. Within minutes, hundreds lay dead or dying. Union artillery on the hill answered the Confederate cannon. Men lay flat on the ground. They prayed for the shelling to stop. Finally it did, and the smoke of battle began to clear. Now the Union soldiers could see across the valley. They watched as the Confederate soldiers formed a long line. It was a sight to take your breath away. Facing Cemetery Hill, the Confederates stood shoulder to shoulder in a line almost two kilometers long. Sunlight shone from their guns. Their battle flags waved. Slowly, the line began to move. It seemed more like a parade than an attack. Shouts went up and down the Union line. Here they come. Here come the rebels. Thousands of Confederate soldiers moved across the valley outside Gettysburg. Union artillery opened fire. The guns tore open big holes in the Confederate battle line. But the Southerners kept moving forward up the hill. Union soldiers rose up from behind stone walls and fallen trees. They poured even more gunfire into the Confederate line. More and more bodies fell to the ground. 
Still, the line moved forward. A few Confederates reached the Union line, but not enough to seize it. They were shot down. Suddenly, the Confederates began racing down the hill. Many raised their hands in surrender. Fifteen thousand began the attack. Only half returned. The Battle of Gettysburg was over. The Union commander, General Meade, was told that the Confederate attack had been broken. He said simply, Thank God. The Confederate commander, General Lee, said, This has been a sad day for us. A sad day. Lee's invasion of the North had failed. There was only one thing he could do now, retreat. He must get his army back to Virginia. He could only hope that the Union army was hurt too badly to chase him. The line of wagons carrying wounded soldiers was twenty-five kilometers long. Many of the wounded needed treatment, but the wagons were not permitted to stop for any reason. Suffering was terrible. An officer who led the wagon train said he learned more about the horrors of war on that one trip than he had learned in all of his battles. Twenty thousand Confederate soldiers were killed, wounded, or listed as missing in the Battle of Gettysburg. Twenty-three thousand Union soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing. General Meade lost so many men that he was in no hurry to chase General Lee. He believed it might be best to let Lee escape than to take a chance on losing what remained of the Army of the Potomac. Meade waited for a week until his army was stronger, but by then Lee and his men had crossed safely back into Virginia. President Abraham Lincoln was angry. He had told General Meade that driving the Confederates out of the North was not enough. The Southern army must be destroyed. We had them, Lincoln said. We had only to stretch out our hands and take them. And nothing I could do or say could make the army move. President Lincoln believed that General Meade had made a mistake, but he felt that the general had ability. Lincoln was thankful for what Meade had done at Gettysburg. He said Meade would continue to command the Army of the Potomac. In November of 1863, President Lincoln went to Gettysburg. He attended the opening of a new burial place for the Union soldiers who had died in the great battle there. The governor of Pennsylvania had asked the president to say a few words at the ceremony. Lincoln agreed. He felt it was his duty to go, to honor the brave men who lost their lives to save the Union. Lincoln hoped his words might help lift the spirit of the nation. Lincoln did not have much time to prepare his speech. He wrote it down the night before the ceremony. Lincoln was sure the speech was not a good one. But it came to be one of the most famous speeches in American history. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.